Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents, for your entertainment, the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you The Sacred Flame, a gripping drama by W. Somerset Maugham. When crippled Morris Tablet dies suddenly, no one questions the doctor's statement that he died of heart failure. No one, that is, except Nurse Wayland, who insists that he has been murdered. But who would want to kill Morris? His devoted wife, Stella, his mother, who adored him, his brother, Colin. Listen in a few moments to the devastating consequences of Nurse Wayland's bitter accusation in The Sacred Flame, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, The Sacred Flame. the essence of the game of chess, old fellow. <laughs> Don't let your son bully me, Mrs. Tablet. I think you're quite capable of taking care of yourself, Doctor. If you moved your bishop, you'd make things a bit awkward for me. Mm. Morris, when I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Mother, is that the way respectable general practitioners talk to their patients in the days of your far distant youth? How on earth do you expect poor Nurse Whalen to read when you never for an instant hold your tongue? <laughs> I can't even hear myself knitting. I don't mind, Mrs. Tabret. Don't worry about me. After listening to my lively conversation and wheeling me around for nearly five years, Nurse Whalen pays no more attention to me than if I were a deaf mute. Well, who can blame her? I know, it's exasperating. It's worse than that, Nurse. It's inconsiderate. If you please, ma'am, Major Lee Condor wants to know if it's too late for him to come in to have a drink. Of course not. Ask him to come in, Alice. A very good man. You know him, don't you, Doctor? No, I've never met him. He's the fellow who's just taken that furnished house on the golf links, isn't he? Mm. Yes, we knew him years ago in India. That's why he came here. Is he a soldier? No, he was a policeman. He's retired now. Oh. He was one of Mother's numerous admirers. Oh, <laughs> nice chap. And I believe he's a rather good golfer. Colin has played with him once or twice. I asked him to dine tonight so that Morris could get a game of bridge, but he couldn't come. Major Leconda. Oh, good evening, John. Hello. How nice of you to come in. I was on my way home and I saw your lights on, so I thought I'd just ask if anyone would like to give me a Doc and Doris. Oh, help yourself. The whiskey's on the table. Thanks, Millie. How are you, nurse? Fine, thanks. And the patient? Bearing up pretty well, considering all he has to put up with. You're in your usual high spirits, I see. I don't think you know, Dr. Harvester. How do you do, Major? Don't let me disturb your game. It's finished. Have you beaten him? Hollow! I haven't come to stay, only to say I was sorry I couldn't come to dinner. I'll just swallow my drink and take myself off. There's no hurry. I'm not going to bed for hours. We're really waiting up for Stella and Colin. They've gone to the opera. Morris, why don't you let Nurse Whalen get you ready? Then you'll only have to slip into bed and Colin can help mm, you. All right. What do you say, Nurse? It's just as you like. I'm quite prepared to stay up until Mrs. Morris comes in and put you to bed after you said goodnight to her. No, come on. You look tired. Put your shoulder to the wheel, Nurse, and gently trundle the wounded hero to his bedchamber. I'll be back in ten minutes. She seems a very nice woman, that nurse. Yes. She's extremely competent, and her patience is really wonderful. She's a jolly good nurse, and you're very lucky to have her. Oh, I'm sure we were. It's a pity she's so tactless. It never seems to occur to her that Morris wants to be alone with his wife. He likes to say goodnight to Stella last thing, and he likes to say it without anyone looking on. That's why he's staying up now. Poor boy. I suppose he's absolutely dependent on a nurse? Absolutely. 
all sorts of rather unpleasant things have to be done for him, poor dear. And he can't bear that anyone should know about them, especially Stella. Is there really no chance of his getting better, Dr. Harvester? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. He was terribly smashed up, you know. The lower part of his spine was broken and he was badly burned when the plane caught fire. What a shocking thing to happen. Yes, indeed. Well, when you think that he was flying all through the war and never had a mishap, it's so silly that this should happen just when he was trying out a new machine. It, it was so unexpected. His courage amazes me. He never seems low or depressed. Never. His spirits are wonderful. It's heartbreaking to watch him in dreadful pain and still forcing a joke from his lips. You know, I'm sorry Colin is going away so soon, Mrs. Tablet. I think his being here has done Morris a lot of good. Yes. As boys, they were great friends, which isn't always the case with brothers. Colin's been away so long. He went to Central America just before Morris crashed, you know. Does he have to go back? Well, he put his share of his father's money in a coffee plantation. Oh, it's doing very well. He loves the life out there. And it seems cruel to ask him to give it all up to help look after his crippled brother. I think it would be most unfair. One has no right to ask anyone to give up his own chance of making the best he can of life. Here yeah, we are again. Ah, mm. I'm fixed up and ready for any excitement. <laughs> Aren't I, nurse? But what's that? What? I, I thought I heard a car. Yes, I did. It's Stella. She's in her new evening dress tonight, Doctor. Just wait till you see her. Which opera was on tonight? Tristan. That's why I insisted on Stella going. It was after seeing Tristan that we got engaged. Do you remember, Mother? Oh, of course I do. It was a wonderful oh, here evening. Is. Oh, here, here she is. is. Stella! Hello, my darling. Uh, mm. Have you missed me? Mm. Why are you back so early, you bad girl? <laughs> you promised me to go and have supper. Why didn't you take her, Colin? <laughs> well... Good evening, Doctor. Well, darling, evening. I was no, so no, no, thrilled no, no, and excited no. by the opera, I felt I simply couldn't eat a thing. Hang it. Oh, oh, hello, Doctor. Hello, Major. You might have gone to Lucian's and mm. had some supper. <sighs> What's the good of my spending the earth buying you a magnificent new dress when you won't let anyone see it? But, darling, I wanted to show it off in the intervals, but it seemed so grand that I hadn't the nerve. <laughs> I kept my cloak on. Well, take it off now and show the gentleman. Oh. Come on. Oh, you are a bully, Morris. <laughs> Oh, there you are, then. Oh, you've made me feel shy now. <laughs> Stand up so we can all see. Ah, it's lovely. Mm. Oh, uh, Stella, <sighs> what, what's the matter? Catch her, Colin. She's going to fall. There you are. Come on. Sit down. Yeah, I'm all right. Nothing, just... Just a little faintness. Stella. It's all right, Morris. Don't fuss. Put your head between your knees, Stella. Mm. Let me help you. No, no, I... I'll be all right in a minute. Silly of me. My belief is that she's just faint from lack of food. Nurse, would you mind going into the kitchen and seeing if you can find anything for these silly young people to eat? Of course not. I'll make them some sandwiches. Colin can get a bottle of champagne from the cellar. All right, Mother. If they're any ice I've got a thirst I wouldn't sell for 20 pounds. Well, I'll say goodbye. I'm sorry you're feeling poorly, Stella. Oh, Mother's right. All I need is a large sandwich, preferably ham. You're looking better now. Mm. For a few moments, you're as white as a sheet. Good night, everyone. Oh, good goodbye. Night, goodbye. Good night, goodbye. It was nice of you to look in. Don't worry, I'll see myself out. If you're not in a hurry, Doctor, wait and have a sandwich with us. And in the meantime, let's take a turn in the garden, shall we? It's so lovely and warm. Good idea. Uh, if the ham sandwiches, I hope Nurse Whalen has essentially used plenty of mustard. Stella, are you sure you're all right? Oh, my darling. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself. You scared the life out of me. Why didn't you go on and have supper before coming home? Oh, I didn't want to. I wanted to get back. But Stella, you go out so seldom. Oh, this is no life for you. Tied up to a cripple. You're young. Oh, darling, darling, don't. Please, uh, I'm not missing anything, I promise you. The fact is, you've lost the habit of going out and having fun. Oh, nothing is fun if you can't share it. Now, don't be idiotic, my poor darling. I wish Colin weren't going away so soon. 
At least you've been able to get out and around with him. He only came home for six months and he stayed nearly a year. You promised you'd try to persuade him to stay on a bit. No, but he must, he must get back to his work. Hmm, I suppose so. I was thinking of you. Oh, now, Morris, darling, you must stop fussing because you think I'm having a thin time. I'm not. You never try to prevent me from doing anything I want to. I don't know what it is to be bored. <laughs> Why, well, I haven't time for half the things I want to do. Yes, you're wonderful, Stella. You always have been. You've made the best of a bad job, all right. I've had to, but why should you? Oh, my darling, don't talk like that. I married you because I loved you. It would be unspeakable if I stopped loving you now that you need my love more than ever. Oh, my dear. We can't love because we ought to. Love comes and goes, and we can none of us help ourselves. <sighs> Morris, what do you mean? Have I done anything to make you think I, I wasn't the same as I'd always been? Of course not, darling. You've been an angel, always. <sighs> What's the matter? You, you suddenly went quite pale. You're not feeling faint again. No. No, I, I'm all right. Perhaps I seem to take for granted all that you do for me, but don't think I'm not conscious all the time how much I owe you. But I've done nothing for you. I've never let you nurse me. Well, I couldn't bear that you should have anything to do with the sordid side of my illness. You know that I'm never going to get well, Stella. Don't you? I don't indeed. It's a long business, we know that, but I'm absolutely convinced you'll get much better. No. They pretend they can do something in order to give me hope. I pretend to believe them because it's the easiest thing to do. But I know I'm on this invalid bed for life, Stella. Oh. Oh. Then let's take what comfort we can in the great joy we've had in one another, in the days when you were well and strong. I shall always be grateful for the happiness you gave me and for your love. Do you think that's changed? I love you as deeply, as devotedly as I ever did. You're everything in the world to me, Stella. I, I ought to be frightened because I'm so dependent on you, but I'm not. Because I know, not just with my mind or my heart, but with, with every nerve in me, with every little feeling and every pain, how good you are to me. Oh, but darling, why, why are you saying all this to me tonight? Because I owe you so much. You know, Stella, when you're an invalid, you find out all sorts of interesting things. People are sympathetic, but you mustn't abuse their sympathy. You soon discover it bores them if you talk about yourself. You must make jokes, make them laugh, so they feel they needn't be sorry for you. Then they go away feeling relieved and kindly disposed towards you. Oh, oh my darling, you break my heart. It's so cruel that you should have had to learn such bitter truths. My dear, they're not as bitter as all that. I shouldn't have mentioned it, only... I wanted to tell you that... It, that it's you... who've given me the courage to carry on. I can stand anything... as long as I know I shall see you tomorrow... and the next day... and the day after... and always. Oh, Morris... I'm unworthy of such love. I'm so ashamed. I'm selfish, thoughtless. Never. And you're so beautiful. You've never looked more beautiful than you do tonight. What is it that, that gives you this sudden new radiance? Well, I don't know why I should look any different from usual. I watch your face. I know every change in it from day to day. 
a year ago you you had a strained look, but now lately you've had an air that that is strangely peaceful. You gained a sort of lovely serenity. Oh, Stella, if only we'd had a child. Someone I could see as part of you and me. And you would have had something to console you. You wouldn't have felt you'd entirely wasted your life. But Morris, darling, I, I, I don't feel I've wasted my life. Oh, look, you, you're not yourself tonight. You're, you're ill and tired. I love you, Stella. I want to take you in my arms, as I used to. I want to press my lips to yours and see your eyes close and your head fall back and feel your dear, soft body. Still, still, I, I can't bear it. Oh, hush now, my darling, please. <laughs> darling, don't. It would have been better for both of us if I'd been killed when I crashed. Oh, darling. I'm no use to you. I'm no use to anybody. Norris, darling, don't. Don't, please, please, darling. <laughs> Forgive me, Stella. Oh, what a complete fool I am. Oh, my dear. You frightened me. It, it's what they call a nerve storm. Good thing Nurse Whalen didn't see me like that. Give me my handkerchief. Oh, yes, here you are. Whiskey and soda is what you want. I'll get you one. No, no, no. I'll... Uh... No, I'll have one later. Oh. In bed. Yes. Sorry I've been so long. There wasn't any ham, so I made toasted bacon sandwiches. Oh. Mmm, they... They look delicious. I'll call the others. Oh, Dr. Harvester! Come and have a sandwich before it gets cold. Stella. Yes, darling. D darling. Hmm? If you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Oh. I suddenly feel very tired. Oh, I I'm, I'm sorry, Morris. Did I hear you calling me? Y yes, you did. Morris doesn't want anything to eat. He's going to bed. Oh, I'm so glad. It's very late. Good night, my boy. Sleep well. Good night, Mother. Bless you. Here, let me give you a hand, us. I can manage perfectly. I'm so used to wheeling the invalid bed, and he weighs nothing. Never mind. Let me push him. Look in on your way to bed, Stella. Yes, of course, darling. Oh, don't be long, Doctor. The sandwiches will be stone cold. I <laughs> Morris is rather nervy tonight. Sorry, I went to the opera. Oh, my dear, you go out so seldom. I haven't the inclination, really. You're tired. Why don't you eat something? No. No, I'll, I'll wait for the others. Whatever happens, darling, I want you to know that I'm deeply grateful for all that you've done for Morris. Why do you say that? You don't think he's getting worse? No, I think he's just the same. I just wanted you to know that I realize what a great sacrifice you've made for him. After all, you didn't marry Morris to be the wife of a helpless cripple. Well, one must take the rough with the smooth. You're a young and beautiful woman. You have the right to live your life just as anyone else has. For five years now, you've given up everything to be the sole comfort of a man who is your husband, only because a legal ceremony had joined you together. Oh, no, no, no. No, because love had joined us together. My poor child. I'm so desperately sorry for you. Whatever the future may have in store, I shall never forget your courage, your self-sacrifice, and your patience. But I... I don't understand what you mean. Don't you? Well, let us suppose that it is the anniversary of my wedding day and my thoughts have been much occupied with the ups and downs of marriage. Ah, here you are at last, Colin. You'd better pour us some wine. Right. Where's Dr. Harvester? Here I am. I've been with Morris. I'll just have a sandwich and swallow my wine and then be off. Is Morris all right? Oh, fairly. He's a bit down tonight for some reason. I, I don't know why. 
He was in great spirits earlier in the oh, evening. I expect he's tired. He insisted on staying up. Well, I've left a sleeping draft that he can take later if he wants it. And I'll go up and see him before I go to bed. If he can get a good rest, I'm sure he'll be his usual self in the morning. Well, I must get home. Good night, Mrs. Stavrit, and thanks for a very pleasant evening. I'll see you to the door, and I'll go straight to bed. Good night, children. Good night, Good night, mother. Good night, mother. Good night doctor. Good night, doctor. Stella. Stella, darling. <laughs> oh, Colin. <gasps> Poor darling. Oh, Colin, what have we done? Morris was so strange tonight. I couldn't make him out. It, it was almost as though he suspected. No, impossible. He must never know. Never. I'd do anything in the world to prevent it. Why did you ever love me? Oh, why did I ever love you? Stella, come here. My darling. No. No. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Excuse me, my dear. Could you pass me a packet of Radeon? Why, of course. Here. Never use anything else to get my wash really white, do you? You know, uh, whoops, mind the trolley. Radeon is a wash out a white in. What? Radeon, an absolute white in, a clean up, a fresh in. And Radeon's so good in washing machines. My wash is whiter to the last sock. Pow! Radeon with Sunflex. Pure white power. Remember that. Now I'll be on with my shopping. Uh, mind the trolley. Well, I never. A white in. Radeon it is then. Pure white power. Pow! Shield brings you the dry look. brings you the dry look with Stay Dry, a formulation unique to the newest Shield aerosol deodorant. It keeps you cool, confident, and feeling poised even in the sheerest of fashions. And Shield's extra dry spray never stings or burns your skin, even if you use Shield right after a bath. Stay Dry with Shield the only deodorant with Stay Dry. My dear Colin, I've only just heard. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was nice of you to come. I was at the golf club and old Blake came to me and said, I say, have you heard that Poor Maurice Tabrit died last night. I couldn't believe it. Oh, I'm afraid it's true all the same. And Maurice seemed comparatively well last night, and in such good spirits. Was he taken worse in the night? No. He just died in his sleep. Oh, I suppose so. He can't have felt ill or would have run for Nurse Wayland. When did you find out, then? Well, you see, sometimes if he had had a bad night, he slept late in the morning. Stella insisted that no one should go in to him until he rang. It was the only matter in which there'd been any friction between her and Ness Wayland. Oh, she was quite right. At least the poor chap was happy when he was asleep. We were just finishing breakfast when Nurse Wayland came in. I noticed she was very white. She said she had just been in to Morris. Stella was furious. I've never seen her so angry. Nurse Wayland was trembling. She looked all funny, scared, you know. I had the feeling something was wrong. Is anything the matter, Nurse, I asked. She gave a sort of cry and clenched her hands and said, he's dead. How terrible. Stella gave a sort of gasp and went into a dead faint. And your mother? Oh, mother was wonderful. I sprang forward to help Stella, and I saw Mother just sitting at the table. She was awfully white. And then she began to tremble. She never made a sound. Just shrank back into her chair and suddenly became an old, old woman. 
she just said you'd better go for Dr. Harvester. I shall never get the sound of her voice out of my ears. Oh, hold on, old man. Don't tell me any more if it upsets you. No, I'm all right. There's nothing more to tell. Mother and Nurse Welland attended Stella and I went for the doctor. He said Morris had been dead for a good two hours. And probably heart failure. How about Stella? She's all right now. And your mother? Harvester's with her. Ah, oh, here he is. Uh, how is Mrs. Tabret? Very upset. I'm trying not to show it. She has wonderful self-control. Do you think she'd like to see me? I'm sure she would. Oh, Nurse Welland, is my mother asleep? No, only resting, Mr. Collin. Then I'll go and ask her, Major. I won't be a moment. I told you to go and lie down, Nurse. I couldn't. I'm too restless. Oh, it's been a shock, no less for you than the family. Yes, a great shock. He was always so brave and cheerful. Yeah, it was always on the cards that he'd go out suddenly. Like a candle that you blow out when you don't want it anymore. Where does the flame go then? My dear, I, I'm afraid you're taking poor Morris's death a good deal more to heart than his wife. Did you think he was only a case to me? Even a nurse is human. Strange as it may seem, she has a heart like other people. Of course she has a heart. But it doesn't do her or her patients any good if she allows her emotions to get the better of her common sense. What, in your opinion, Doctor, did Morris Tabret actually die of? Heart failure. Are you going to put that on the death certificate? Certainly. You've told me half a dozen times that Morris might have lived for years. He might have. I can tell you now that it's a blessing for everyone concerned that he didn't. Dr. Harvester, Morris Tabret was murdered. What are you talking about? Do you want me to repeat it? Morris Tabret was murdered. Do you mean that you intended that statement to be taken quite literally? Quite. But my dear, why should anyone want to murder poor Morris? That at present is no business of mine. Now look here, nurse. You know perfectly well that everyone connected with him was devoted to Morris. No one was ever more surrounded by love and affection than he was. I, it's incredible that anyone should even have wished him harm. Whatever I may think or may not think, I'm at liberty to keep to myself. Oh, come now. You know as well as I do that Morris died of natural causes. What on earth is the use of making a fuss and getting everyone upset? If he died of natural causes, a post-mortem will prove it. And then I shall have nothing more to say. I am not going to have a post-mortem. It's quite unnecessary. I must warn you. If you sign the death certificate, I shall go straight to the coroner and protest. I should have thought the tablets have enough to put up with without your forcing such an ordeal on them. Major Laconda, you were in the police, weren't you? Tell me, what is the duty of a nurse who has reason to believe her patient has died by foul play? I suppose her duty is quite clear. But I think she should be sure that her reasons are valid before she exposed to distress and publicity a family that has treated her with unvarying kindness. Yes. Yes, you're right. Everyone in this house has treated me with the greatest consideration. I do at least owe it to them to make no charges behind their back. Does that mean you want them uh, sent for? Yes. In point of fact, I think I hear Mrs. Tabret coming now. I'll go and fetch Stella. My dear Major, how kind of you to come. Oh, I felt I must come and see you for a moment. I'm sure you know how deeply I sympathize with you. If there's any way I can be of service. Thank you. I'm trying to put my own feelings out of sight and mind and think only that my son's martyrdom has ended. I won't weep because he is dead. I will rejoice because he is free. Good morning, Major Leconda. Dr. Harvester told me you were here. I came to say how much I feel for you and your great loss. Thank you. You know, Morris and I often talked of death. He, he was never afraid of it. He didn't even attach much importance to it. He asked me not to wear mourning for him, but to go about and do things exactly as if he were alive. He loved you so much, Stella. He put your happiness above everything. <sighs> Nurse Wayland, you'll be leaving us now, I suppose. I want to thank you for everything you did for Morris and to tell you how deeply grateful I am to no, you. I don't need gratitude. I only did my duty. <sighs> What's the matter? Stella, I've got something unpleasant to tell you. I would sooner not have to add to your present trouble, but I'm afraid it can't be avoided. But what is it? 
Nurse Wayland is not satisfied that Morris's death was due to his illness. She thinks there was some other cause. But I, I don't understand what other cause could there be. She says he was murdered. Oh, murdered? You must be mad, nurse. It's preposterous. However, I presume she has some grounds for her statement. What are they? Well, nurse? You all know that Mr. Morris suffered from sleeplessness. Dr. Harvester had prescribed a sedative, chlorolin. Will you repeat the instructions you gave me last night, doctor? Morris was excited and overwrought. I asked Nurse Whalen to give him a tablet and told him that if he woke in the night, he could take it. I dissolved the tablet in half a glass of water and put it by his side. There were five tablets left. This morning, the bottle was empty. That's very strange. Very. Would five tablets have been a fatal dose, Doctor? Six, including the one I left for him. Yes, there's no doubt the effect would have been fatal. It's incredible. Well, it's much more likely that someone took them for his own use. If so, they must have been taken after I went to bed. But no one went into Morris's room last night after that but me. I went in to say good night to him. You're not under the impression that I took the tablets, I suppose, Nurse Wayland? If you had, you could presumably produce at least four of them. Believe me, if you'd taken those five tablets at midnight, you wouldn't be sitting here now. The fact remains that five tablets disappeared last night. Where are they? Doctor, is it possible that Morris can have died from chloral poisoning? I have told you that I was satisfied that death was due to natural causes. I wasn't asking that. Yes, of course, it's possible. But I don't for an instant believe it. But I'm so confused. It's come as such a terrible shock. Nurse Wayland, do you really think that Morris died of an overdose of his sleeping tablets? I do. No, it's absurd. Who on earth would have thought of murdering Morris? It's out of the question. Oh, no, no. Nurse Wayland can't seriously think that anyone would deliberately give Morris an overdose. But I'm beginning to be desperately afraid that perhaps he took it himself. Suicide? Well, he wasn't... he wasn't himself last night. He was... he was very strange. I'd never seen him so upset. Did he speak of suicide? No. What did he say? Well, really, Nurse Whalen, there are some things I can't tell you. What passed between my husband and myself concerned only ourselves. I beg your pardon. I only thought it would be better for your own sake to be frank. What do you mean? Are you accusing me of holding anything back? I'm not accusing anybody. My dear, I won't ask you anything that is painful to answer, but there's this. If there is anything in what Nurse Whalen says, I suppose there'll have to be an inquest. The coroner will certainly ask you if your husband said anything at all that might indicate that suicide was in his mind. Well, he, he said it would have been better if the accident had killed him outright. But he wasn't thinking of himself, he was thinking of me. That's very important. Nurse Wayland, if poor Morris did take an overdose of something, can't you square your conscience to say nothing about it? He had so little to live for. Can't you let him go in peace and spare us the distress of a post-mortem and inquest? But you see... I don't believe your husband committed suicide. Why not? He was sometimes very depressed. And for that reason, I didn't think it wise to leave within his reach the means of putting an end to himself. I always kept the tablets well out of his reach. I never saw him depressed. I know you didn't. You never saw anything else. Well, what have I done to you? Why do you speak to me like that? Your face is, is twisted with hate. I, I don't understand. Don't you? Oh, I'm beginning to be frightened of you. What sort of woman have we had in our house for five years? There's nothing to be frightened of, darling. Don't give way to your nerves. Because he joked and laughed when you were there. Did it never occur to you that there were moments when he was overwhelmed by black despair? But why did he insist on hiding it from me? His one aim was to make his suffering easy for you to bear. Whatever pain he had, he hid from you so that you should never have the distress of being sorry for him. How can you say such dreadful things? Everything he had had to be hidden from you. 
When you were coming, the medicine bottles and the dressings had to be put away so that there should be nothing to remind you that there was anything the matter with him. I would willingly have done anything for him that you did. It was his most earnest wish that I should not concern myself with that side of his illness. That's true, nurse. I'm sorry you don't think Stella did all she could for Morris. As his mother, I'm perhaps no less competent than you to judge. I have only admiration for her unselfishness. Oh, Mother. I always think we do the best by people when we help them in the way they want to be helped. There's a lot in that. I'm sure Stella did Morris most good by answering him back in the same strain when he chaffed her, and when he laughed laughing with him. I was nothing. Only his paid nurse. He didn't try to hide from me the despair that filled his heart. He didn't have to pretend with me. He didn't have to be good-tempered or amusing with me. He could be morose and know I wouldn't mind. He could quarrel with me and know he couldn't hurt me. What are you telling us, Nurse Wayland? I'm telling you the truth at last. What a strange truth it is. But, Nurse, what you've been saying suggests that in one of his moments of despair, he must have thought of suicide. It was just one of those moments that I was on guard against. The sleeping tablets were kept in the bathroom on an upper shelf. I had to stand on a chair myself to reach them. Was it impossible, Dr. Harvester, for Morris to have crossed the room into the bathroom and stood up on a chair? Quite impossible. He had no power in the lower part of his body. His back was broken in the accident and his spinal cord was injured. Well, the matter can't be left like this. I'm afraid, Harvester, there'll have to be an inquest. But confound it, man. No one commits murder without a motive. No one had the smallest reason to wish Morris dead. How do you know? Everyone was devoted to him. Did you know his wife was going to have a baby? <gasps> you fiend! Stella! I suspected it last night when she nearly fainted. This morning, I knew for certain. Are you accusing me of murdering my husband? Is it true what she says, Stella? Shall I keep lunch and back, madam? Is it one o'clock? No. You can serve it. We can't have lunch now, Mother. Why not? Lay for two extra, Alice. Major Laconda and Dr. Harvester will be lunching. Very good, madam. Mother, it's impossible. How can we all sit down as though nothing had happened? I think it's just as well. We have a great deal more to say to one another. It will do none of us harm to talk of other things for half an hour. No, I, I, I couldn't. P please let, let me stay here. I insist on your coming, my dear. I must go home, Mrs. Tablet. I'll have a bite there and come back immediately. Very well. Will you come, Nurse Wayland? No. I'll have something sent up to your room. I don't want anything. You may when it comes. Lunch is served, madam. Come, Stella. You know the pepsodent you've been using? Pretty good toothpaste, wasn't it? But now there's all new pepsodent. It's a toothpaste revolution. Get your teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent made with Erlium actually polishes teeth dazzle white. It doesn't scratch. All new Pepsodent, the greatest toothpaste discovery in your lifetime. But you don't have to believe that just because we say so. Extensive laboratory tests prove that it's true. If you'd like to see the results of those tests for yourself, write to Pepsodent, Box 909, Durban, and we'll send you documentary proof that all new Pepsodent gets teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent gives you the smile that dazzleizes. From the fertile fields of the eastern Transvaal come new flavor Royco's farm fresh vegetable. Plump chickens come from lush Natal. Our beef steaks are the beefiest, our herbs and spices subtle and delicate. So come home to Royco, made from the freshest and youngest. That's why Royco soups taste the best and cook the quickest in only seven minutes. New flavor Royco, warm, friendly, satisfying, made with the good things you would choose. Oh, 
Have you finished lunch already? More or less. Are you all right? Mm, yes. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't stay in the dining room. It was awful sitting there as though nothing had happened. I don't know what induced Mother to make us go through that fuss. Oh, I dare say it was sensible. With the servants there, it was obvious that we had to hold our tongues. It gave us all a chance to collect ourselves. Stella, is it true? About the baby? Yes, it's true. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to. You were going to let me go away without knowing. I didn't want to spoil your last weeks here. Because I was worried didn't seem to be any reason why you should be worried, too. But what were you going to do? I didn't know. I was desperately trying to find a way out. I thought it would be easier when you were gone. Whatever happened, I wanted to keep you out of it. But, darling, this is something I must share with you. Surely you realize that. When a woman tells a man she's going to have his baby, it's important to her. She wants to be made a fuss of. I couldn't expect you to feel joy or pride, only consternation. Stella, you do realize, don't you, how much I love you? <gasps> don't call her. Don't say anything that, that's going to upset me. I don't want to get emotional. If we've got to talk about it, let's do so as calmly as we can. What's that dreadful woman going to do now? Oh, I don't know. I don't care. Oh, no, that's not true. I'm frightened to death. Oh, God, what's going to happen to us? You do love me, Stella, don't you? Oh, yes. I wish I didn't, but I do. Oh. Lunch oh, over already? Yes. Forgive me for coming through the French doors, but I walked through the garden. Mother and Major Lacanda will be here in a moment. They're still having coffee. And Nurse Good. Welland had lunch in her room. Perhaps you'd better fetch her, Colin. Right, oh. Won't be a moment. I, uh, I hope, my dear, this is going to come out all right. <sighs> Doesn't look much like it, does it? Mm. Dr. Harvester, will you tell me something? Yes. Do you think it possible that Morris could have guessed... Uh, about the child. I, I shouldn't think so. Oh, I hope not. I couldn't have borne the thought that he died rather than expose me to shame and disgrace. He was capable of that, you know. My dear, I'm afraid that if Morris died of an overdose, he can't have taken it himself. But who could have given it to him? That is the question, isn't it? Oh. Yes, Nurse Whalen. Oh, oh, yes. I can hear Mother and the Major. Oh, you're back quickly, Doctor. Have we kept you waiting? I hope you've had everything you wanted in your room, nurse. Everything, thank you, Mrs. Tabret. Well, uh, well, sit down, everyone. Now, we are in your hands, Nurse Wayland. Have you decided what to do? Major Leconda asked your daughter-in-law a question before luncheon. She didn't answer it. I'm afraid you must have thought me very impertinent, Stella. Nurse Wayland said you were going to have a baby. And I asked you if it was true. It's quite true. And then another question inevitably rises in one's mind. It... It's difficult for me to ask it. I'll answer without your asking. Of course, it's quite impossible that Morris should have been the father of the child I'm expecting. Since his accident, he's been my husband in name only. I am the father, Major Laconda. You! Do you mean to say that it escaped your sharp eyes, nurse? That Colin and Stella were in love with each other? Oh, oh, did you know? Nowadays, I find the young are apt to think their elders even more stupid than advancing years generally make them. Oh, Mother, what must you think of me? Do you much care? I suppose I ought to be terribly ashamed of myself. But I must be honest. I could no more stop falling in love with Colin than I, than I could help the rain falling. You're shameless. But you have every right to think that I treated Morris shamefully, Mother. He's beyond the reach of pain, but I bitterly regret the pain I've caused you. I have no excuses to make for myself. My dear, don't you remember what I said to you last night? I thanked you for all you'd done for Morris. Did you think I was talking at random? I knew then that you were going to have a baby and that Colin was the father. 
I blame myself. Not for loving Stella, but for not going away as soon as I find out. What, whatever you think of me, I ask you to believe that I didn't give myself to Colin to, to, to gratify any passing whim. I love him with all my heart. I know, dear. I, I struggled against it. I, I told myself that the only return I, I could make Morris for, for all the devotion he gave me was by remaining faithful to him. I tried to drive Colin away. I did everything except ask him to go. I couldn't do that. And Morris was so pleased to have him here. Yes, I understand. I don't understand you, Mrs. Tablet. You seem to be going out of your way to find excuses for your daughter-in-law. If you knew what was going on, why didn't you stop it? I'm afraid I shall shock you, Nurse Wayland. Stella is young, healthy and normal. When Morris's accident made it impossible for him and Stella to ever live again as man and wife, I asked myself how long she'd be able to support such a false relationship. No one could say that you had much trust in human nature. I have a great deal. I knew that Stella's pity was infinite. I knew that she meant everything in the world to Morris. Everything. But I feared the time would come when she could no longer be content with a miserable life that was all that Morris had to offer her. If she wanted to go, I felt we had no right to prevent her. And I knew that if she went, Morris would die. I would never have left him, never. I was willing to shut my eyes to anything, as long as she stayed with Morris. I found myself wishing she'd take a lover. Mrs. Tabret! When Colin came back, and after a while, I realized that he and Stella are in love. I was glad. I felt that this would make things right for Morris. She wouldn't go now. She was bound to this house by a stronger tie than pity or kindness. But didn't it strike you what great dangers you were exposing them to? I didn't care. I thought only of Morris. When they were children, I think I loved both my sons equally. But since his accident, I haven't had room in my heart for anyone but Morris. He was everything to me. For him, I was prepared to sacrifice Colin and Stella. I hope they'll forgive me. As if there were anything to forgive. You'll only laugh at me if I say I'm shocked. But I can't help it. I'm shocked to the very depths of my soul. I was afraid you would be. Well, with a baby on the way, you must admit that Morris's death has come in the very nick of time to get her out of a very awkward predicament. What a cruel and heartless thing to say. Are you sure your motive for causing all this trouble is anything more than your bitter hatred of me? Why should I hate you? Believe me, I only despise you. You hate me because you were in love with Morris. How dare you say that? You gave it away constantly. I could see that you were fonder of Morris than a nurse generally is of her patient. But it didn't strike me as serious until this morning. I know now that you were madly in love with him. And if I was, what of it? Nothing. Except that it's my turn to be shocked. In the circumstances, I think it was rather horrible and disgusting. Yes, I loved him. My love grew as yours faded. I loved him because he was so... so helpless. So dependent on me. I never showed my love. It... It would have meant nothing to him. He had no room in his heart for anyone but you. You think you were kind and considerate. If you'd loved him as I did, you'd have seen how less than nothing was all you did for him. I could think of a hundred ways to give him happiness, but they would have meant nothing to him. And you, whom he loved, could think of none of them. Nurse Wayland, I'm sorry for what I said just now. It was stupid of me and unkind. I suppose there is something beautiful in love, of whatever kind it is. Will you let me thank you for the love you gave my husband? No! It's an impertinence to offer me your thanks. I'm sorry you should think that. All you had for him was pity. But I loved him with all my heart. I never asked anything but to be allowed to help and serve him. What was he to you? What was he to his mother? To me, he was my life. And you...
killed him. That's a lie. Come, Nurse Wayland, you have no right to say that. How dare you stand there and insult Stella? The situation is perplexed. It's true, and you know it. I know nothing of the kind. I only know that you've worked yourself into a state in which you are saying all sorts of things for which you have no justification. My dear, I could no more have killed Morris than, than I could walk a tightrope. Doesn't it occur to you that there was nothing to prevent my leaving him? Who could have blamed me? I could have gone away with Colin. Yes, and heaven knows I wanted you. You'd have been afraid of the scandal. And you knew that your treachery would have broken your husband's heart. You couldn't face that. You preferred to kill him. After knowing me for five years, Nurse Wayland, how can you think me capable of such wickedness? Your husband loved and trusted you. He was bedridden. He was defenseless. If you were capable of being unfaithful to him, you were capable of killing him. Are you not falling into a rather vulgar error, my dear? Chastity is a very excellent thing, but it isn't the whole of virtue. There's kindness and courage and consideration. Are you defending her for having been untrue to your son? I'm excusing her. I know she gave Boris all she could, and the rest was not within her power. Oh, my dear, you're so kind and wise. No, darling, I'm only so old. Stella, I'm sorry, but Nurse Wayland has made a definite accusation. It must be met. If Morris died of an overdose of sleeping tablets, it was administered by somebody. It was not given to him by me. You appear to have been the last person who saw him last night. You said he was upset earlier in the evening. Why? Oh, must I tell you? It was very private. No, I, I have no right to ask you anything, but if there's an inquest, you'll be asked. Oh. But he, he broke down because he couldn't love me as, as he wanted to love me. He said, he said he would have so liked us to have a child. But when you went in to say goodnight to him, he made no further reference to that? No, none. He seemed quite recovered. Did he ask you for anything before you went? The sleeping draught, for instance? No, Major Laconda. Morris did not ask me for the sleeping draught, and I did not give it to him. May I ask a question now? Certainly. Why were you so upset when I came in this morning and told you I'd been into your husband's room? I was angry with you for going in before he called. Are you sure you weren't afraid I'd gone in too soon? Oh. Supposing he'd been still alive and it had been possible to save him? You've made up your mind that I murdered Morris, haven't you? I know you did. You have done what you thought was your duty, Nurse Wayland. Well and good. It's obvious the matter cannot rest here and the responsibility is now mine. There is no need for us to take up any more of your time. I'll go. I'm just as anxious to leave you as you all are to get rid of me. But I can't go, Mrs. Tabret, without saying how... how sorry I am to have repaid your kindness by bringing this unhappiness upon you. I know you must hate me. It seems frightful, but I... I do ask you to believe that I... I can't help myself. Before we part, my dear, I should like, if I could, to release your spirit from the bitterness that's making you so unhappy. Bless you for the kindness you showed my poor Morris and for the unselfish love you bore him. Oh, I'm so desperately unhappy. Please leave your address, Nurse Wayland. Dr. Harvester will communicate with the proper authorities and they will want to get in touch with you. I shall go and see the coroner and put the facts before him. If you don't mind, Mrs. Tabret, I'll ring up his place from here and find out if he's in. Before you do that, May I say something? Of course. I'll try to be brief. Stella is mistaken in thinking that she was the last person who saw Morris alive. I saw him and spoke to him later. You! I couldn't sleep last night. There was no light in Morris's room, but I had a strange feeling that he was lying awake too. I opened his door quietly. But he heard me and called me in. What time was this? I don't know. Perhaps an hour after you left. He told me he'd taken his sleeping draught, but it hadn't had any effect. Then he said, Mother, be a sport and give me another. 
It can't hurt for once, and I do want to have a decent sleep. Yes, he was, uh, he was very nervy last night. I suppose his usual dose wasn't enough. Very early after his accident, I promised Morris that if life became intolerable to him, I would give him the means of putting an end to it. Oh, Mother, no. I said that if his suffering was so great that he couldn't bear them any longer, and he solemnly asked me to help him, I wouldn't shirk the responsibility. And sometimes he'd say, does that promise still hold? And I'd answer, yes, dear, it does. But did, did he ask you last night? No. What happened then? I knew Stella's love meant everything to Morris. And I knew that she no longer had any to give him because she'd given all her love to Colin. Poor Morris could not stand losing her. But Stella had done as much for him as even I, his mother, could ask of her. I was not so selfish as to demand from her the sacrifice of all that makes a woman's life worthwhile. Oh, why didn't you give me the chance? It was a lovely, lovely dream he dreamed. And I loved him too much to let him ever wake from it. For I loved Morris. He was everything to me. I gave him life, and I took life away from him. Mrs. Tappert, it's impossible. Oh, how dreadful. I went into the bathroom and climbed on the chair and got the bottle of chloroline. I took the five tablets and dissolved them in a glass of water. I took it in to Morris and he drank it at a gulp. Then I sat by the side of his bed, holding his hand until he fell asleep. When I withdrew my hand, I knew it was sleep from which he would never awake. He dreamed his dream to the end. Oh, Mother. Oh, what will be the end of this? I'm so frightened. Oh, my dear, don't worry about me. What I did, I did deliberately. Oh. And I'm quite ready to face the consequences. Well, it's my fault. How can I ever forgive myself? Oh, no, you mustn't be silly. You mustn't think about me or distress yourselves at what happens to me. You and Colin must go away, marry, and have your child. And you must forget the past. You're young, and you have a right to life and happiness. Oh, Mother, darling. Oh, Mother, you make me feel so ashamed. My son, I love you, too. I have your happiness very much at heart. Oh, my dear, dear Millie, what can I say? Dr. Harvester, are you still willing to sign the death certificate? Yes. Then sign it. If there are ever any questions, I'm prepared to swear that I left the tablets on Morris's table by his bed. Oh, Nurse Wayland. We are very grateful to you, Nurse Wayland. So infinitely grateful. Oh, Mrs. Tablet. I've been so petty and revengeful. I, I never realized how mean I was. Come, come, my dear. Don't let us get emotional. We're both of us lonely women now. Let us help one another. So long as you and I can keep our love for Morris alive in our hearts, he's not really dead. in the church where a wedding has been lives in a dream waits at the